I was thinking a couple of days ago as I was evaluating the book of uh, Proverbs and, um, you know, I feel that uh, religion has done a really, really bad job at reducing and raping the book of Proverbs, diluting it, making it just a book of advice. And uh, there is so much more eternal weight in uh, the book of Proverbs. And what I love about uh, the book of Proverbs is that the first chapter, actually the first verse opens up by saying, these are the wise sayings of Solomon, the son of King David, who began to reign. That's Proverbs 1.1. And so he lets us know that everything that he writes in this book is going to be from the perspective of not just a wise man, but a man who is a son and a man who now has sons. And so Proverbs chapter one, you see it in every subsequent subsequent chapter after that. Proverbs two says the same thing. Proverbs three says the same thing. Proverbs four, he always says, my son, attend to my words. My son, store my words, my son. And so I really think you need to uh, consider how you look and how you uh, review the book of Proverbs because there is a lot of information from the perspective of a man fathered the right way. I'm going to say this again. There is a lot. Everybody knows it's a book of wisdom. It's a book of war. Actually, it is also a book. It is actually a book of wealth, but it's also a book about what life is like when you've been fathered the right way. Okay. And Solomon is a man who had a lot of extreme uh, encounters with darkness, encounters with the dark side, encounters with devils. I mean, he, we know that he had uh, a thousand, he has 700 wives, 300 concubines, or the reverse, 300 wives, 700 concubines, but a thousand women total. So we know why God ended up granting him with wisdom once he got delivered. But the point is, is that Solomon was a man who understood the dynamics and the conversations from father to son. Delving deep into this, you know what also is a very strong, consistent thing in the book of Proverbs, and you know one of the things that Solomon continuously gave insight about throughout the duration of the book, it was the issue of seduction. S-E-D-U-C-T-I-O-N, seduction. I'm amazed, and you know, I've studied the book of Proverbs, Proverbs all of my life, but I'm amazed at how many times he dealt with flattery, seduction, the strange woman is commonly how how he phrases it, a strange woman, a harlot. Talks about how uh, the strange woman opposes wisdom and calls men into her bed. So it, there is a lot of information in the book of Proverbs about seduction. And so if you are deciphering the overall philosophy of the book of Proverbs, wisdom is dispersed in a number of areas. It's your work, it's your wealth. Uh, it's your future, but it's also uh, uh, giving you the capacity to understand the trap of seduction. I have often said that one of the disadvantages of this generation, and I don't mean chronologically, I'm, because it's not just applicable to the millennials, and I wish y'all would stop acting like that. The baby boomers, the millennials, the all of you guys. One of the things that is going wrong with this species of people that are alive on planet Earth right now is their inability and their unwillingness to discern a trap. Their inability and their unwillingness to discern a trap. And you know, for every destiny, if we're taking the book of Proverbs and its principles uh, to give us literal pragmatism for how to pursue purpose and how to pursue prosperity, uh, then one of the things that we have got to consider is there must be a trap to every uh, 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 assault or every dis assignment on a person. Now, commonly, this is revealed by the snare of seduction. Seduction can be sexual. Seduction can be financial. Seduction can be uh, 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 mental. Seduction can be emotional. Satan doesn't use the same thing to seduce everybody. Satan uses several things to attract whatever appeals to the flesh in that person. So if you're expecting God to cause you to be graced to fulfill your purpose and to fulfill your calling, you have got to have a plan for what you you're going to do when you are confronted with the power of seduction. Another thing that we pull out and we retrieve from the philosophy of the book of, Sol of, of, of Proverbs is this. Solomon, from a father's perspective, did so much writing about how to avoid seduction, which really means that it must have been his idea that if he was going to dare make himself a father or be uh, a, a seen and revered that way by people because of his wisdom, his accomplishments, or whatever, 
longer, then one of the things that uh, he had to be efficacious in and one of the things that he needed to be potent with was his insight on seduction, which shows us that one of the reasons or one of the ministries or one of the anointings in a real father is to help have a real conversation with those that rely on him, dare we call them sons, about what they're going to do about seduction. This has nothing to do with preaching, nothing to do with teaching, nothing to do with sitting on platforms, nothing to do with carrying rings, water, and Bible. One of the things that we saw that Solomon always talked about was seduction. Stay away from that strange woman. Avoid her bed. Don't listen to her words. One of the chapters in Proverbs says, her mouth is like honey, and what she says to you is smooth as butter. I mean, but talks about uh, how she calls men into her bed saying, come and come and sleep with me. So I've noticed in my life and my talking uh, with people and in my dealings with ministers, one of the things that almost come up accidentally is 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 phone call is what is going on in or over or around your world that's attempting to seduce you to seduce you and everybody called to any level of ministry will have to face seduction. It may be women, it may be money, it may be men. It may be promotion, it may be opportunity, but something is going to be thrown at you from the deepest places in hell with bait that is attractive for who you are and that's capable of ending you forever. So one of the things that I know about fathers is that they've got to have an eye for seduction, which means that a real father will not be the source that God uses or the source that leads you to darkness. They won't be the source that teaches you how to cope with your darkness. They won't be the source that trains you on how to go and be in your darkness undetected and unseen. And often in our culture, that's what we see from a lot of these guys is that they teach you how to whore around, how to have multiple women, how to have prostitutes and strippers and all that stuff and not get caught. But according to the word of God, the basis of the wisdom of Solomon was to instruct on how to avoid the power of seduction because he know that the strength of, sed of seduction is to assassinate your purpose is to bankrupt you from your success and to enable you to never see the reason you were supposed to be born alive. So I do a great amount of teaching on the power of seduction. I see it prophetically. Uh, I warn people about it. I deal with ministry gifts about it. And uh, I, it's about time that we've had a conversation with this. If you're going to have success, you've got to be ready to be seduced. You've got to be ready for seductive attempts at your personhood in moments where you are weak, in moments where you are vulnerable in moments when you are in transition. There are going to be key times in your life where you are ripe for a taste, a, a, a spirit of seduction. Now here's the challenge. The challenge is many people believe that they're going to be able to pre or perceive a seductive attempt. I'm going to automatically know uh, when Satan sends something or somebody with an agenda of seduction in them. But if that were the case, then it would not be considered an effective trap because an effective trap has to be difficult to see, has to contain something that appeals to you, and has to be something that finds you in a moment where you are vulnerable, in a moment where your logic is out of mind in a moment where you're not thinking like yourself, but most importantly, in a moment where your future does not matter because you're not considering the consequences, the repercussions, or, or the aftermath of giving in to a seductive trap. But I want to release this to you, that if you're going to protect anything, the most important thing past your salvation that you need to protect is your future. You have got to go forth in protecting your future no matter who likes it. Now, Satan is not going to try to seduce you with something that you don't like. The truth is, he knows the tendencies and the inclinations of your sin nature, and whatever you are inclined to by your sin nature is going to be what Satan plays platforms to make appealing, attractive, and alluring to you, particularly in moments where you think you're going to be made better or be made whole by the thing that's offered on the trap. So I'm concerned about it, but I'm also concerned about how many fathers are not dealing with it and are not talking about it and are not looking for it and are not confronting it. So the power of seduction is going to vary person to person, give to give, purpose to person. But if you're going to lead talented people, if you're going to minister to talented people, you had better be sure 
sure that you have got to be well versed in seduction and its agenda because it's going to come. It may come through opportunity. It may come through platform. A, a major strategy, even of the spirit of this age through our culture, is the power of seduction. You see it on Instagram. You see it in conversation. You see it in preachers. All of that. This culture reeks of seduction. Uh, social networking. I mean, it just reeks of all sorts of seduction. And so uh, I'm concerned about this, but I want to let you know what seduction is after. Uh, the story of, of, of Samson, the, the judge, okay? He was not only a judge, but the Bible refers to him as a deliverer which means that he had a responsibility and he had potential and he had a purpose to bring deliverance. That is to emancipate the people of God from her adversaries and from her harassers and from those that have been poised and committed to her demise. So in order for that anointing, God put supernatural deliverance ability or supernatural strength, he would do superhuman things the Bible says he would tear animals apart. He would take on whole armies. His strength would enable him to pick up the jawbone of an ass and de devastate thousands of people. The, the way the Bible says it is actually heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of an ass. And so he developed a reputation of being li like a terrorist to the adversaries and the opponents of Israel. When an army would set their self against the people of God, the spirit of the Lord would come upon Samson in power and he would be able to strong arm the them supernaturally by the power of God. So seduction, I want you to hear this in all of its forms, is going to be most potent against the life of a person that was born to bring deliverance. The attempt of seduction is going to be most potent against the life of an individual that was born to bring deliverance. Now I think that everybody shares some uh, 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 responsibility to some degree or another to bring deliverance, but I believe that there are other people, other species uh, 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 of men ministry gifts and of voices and words that were baptized in war and it flows through them intravenously and so deliverance and spiritual combat and spiritual conquest and spiritual conflict beats in everything they do. They were literally inscribed with the war insignias of heaven in their DNA and they can't help but be foremost in the war campaigns and the war agenda of God. So then if the devil can't do a thing about their strength, about their focus, about their concentration, about their capacity, about their aptitude, about their learnedness, what Satan will do is devise a seductive strategy. Come up with a body to host the agenda and come up with a flattery or a statement or an appeal out of this host of this destructive power. So the body that hosts this spirit cannot be opposite of what you don't desire. The body will reflect the desire. So it's more than a person, it's actually a program that's been cultivated or been crafted to assault you in the area of your strength. Now here's a problem. When you look at the story of Samson and Delilah, Samson was never deceived. Be reminded that Samson had an unusual relationship with the strength of God and a very unusual relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come upon him and enable him to do miraculous ways. So Samson was never deceived. Delilah never presented to Samson a deceptive intent. If you follow the story, Samuel, I mean, Samson was grieving a wife, a widow, and when he was confronted and fell in love with the host of the spirit of destruction, he had no reason to love her. He had no history. The Bible says he saw her in the field and Samuel and Samson loved her. He loved her. Now that could have not have been an informed love, which means it couldn't have been God's kind of love because God, lo God's love is not ignorant or ill-informed. It is very informed. It is very wise and it is not a feeling. It's a choice. But the feeling that Samson got was a form of erotic love because of the host of the spirit. And many of you watching me, you preachers, you singers, you ministers and uh, emerging, you writers, what you don't realize is you have developed a soulish attachment and uh, a mesmerization. You have become enamored. You have become infatuated with a person that is the host of 
of a seductive agenda, but their objective is not your heart. Their objective is not your mind. Their objective is not your money. They may take advantage of all of those things, but I'm going to tell you what the spirit of Delilah was after. She targeted his strength. Her assault could only be executed well if his strength level was diminished. And so his strength was a part of his destiny. It was a part of his weaponry for his purpose and weaponry for his life. So again, the agenda of seduction is that it is aimed at your strength. Several times the Bible said Delilah kept plowing him, pressing into him, pressing into him. Tell me where your strength is. Tell me where your strength is. Tell me where his strength is. Now heretofore, Samson had protected that information or the key to his heart or the key to his inner man. He had guarded it with his very life, but because she continued to press him and continued to press him and she never said she loved him. She just reminded him, if you love me, then you'll tell me the secret to your strength. What we're doing is when you're facing seduction, you may really legitimately feel like you have love towards this thing, but this thing does not love you. In fact, it's close because it hates you. It wants to be close because it hates you. It wants to get a premier seat in your life, in your affection, and in your emotions to make sure that it kills you accurately and to make sure that you don't live again. And I'm concerned about the flirtatious nature of the engagement of these preachers, the flirtatious nature of the engagement of these choir leaders, the flirtatious nature of the interaction between pastors and people in the congregants. We're not talking about the assignment of seduction and seductive behavior and seductive attempts and seductive releases. So one of the things that you've got to realize about Delilah is that she's assigned to the thing that makes you strong. She's not going to come for your weakness. She's going to come in the moment of weakness. But your weakness is just an opportunity for you to relax and trust. In this season, don't you dare trust the host of the spirit of seduction, a voice, a friend, an old lover a baby daddy, an old mama, some hellion that wants to make you feel like I understand you. You can be yourself around me. When all of those church people are gone, I know the real you. Just be normal. Let's just hang. Let's be cool. Let's just talk sometime. Where we at? Let's hang out. Let's go. You've got to train your ear how to hear the articulation of a seductive attempt. And yes, they're going to be nice people. They're not going to be mean and evil. They're not going to do anything to turn you off. What they're going to do is present something in your direction that's going to be appealing for you and is going to be something that draws you closer and closer to relax, to retreat, to reprieve, to let stuff go and just let down your hair. Ultimately, what happened? After Delilah was effective at getting close to this man that was the house of this strength level from God, she established a network. So she came up with a whole squad. Now, these people were different bodies, but they embodied the same agenda, a network, a group of people that were committed to ensnaring him. And the Bible says that once his hair was cut, now remember the reason he grew his hair long was because of a, a consecration vow to the Lord. He told her basically the strength of my, or the secret to my strength is my consecration. I can, I took a vow of consecration and my the length of my hair is reflective of the length and the depth of my consecration. And I can't cut it to the time that I am consecrated to the Lord, right? So when she told him that, that's what he went after. Consecration. Stop worshiping. Stop praying. Stop fasting. Stop desiring holiness. Stop thinking about holiness. It's all under grace. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. You don't take all that. You just have some fun. They started diluting the agenda of the consecration and once you give a seductress your consecration she's got you she's got you that's actually what the army said when they came and arrested him with strong weaves around his arm got him what are you going to do now and so not only did they encapture him they ensnared him they put him in a prison and the bible says they started to mock him look at you you were the one who used to bring deliverance you used to preach about slavery and servitude look at you ha 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 and they mocked him because one of the effective attempts of seduction is mocking you about your decision to be who god called you to be they're going to mock you for going to a church that preaches 
his holiness. They're going to mock you for not wanting to compromise and go gambling and go hoeing around and go on a flesh fest and stripper crusades and midnight runs all up and down downtown New York and downtown Atlanta and downtown Chicago, flaunting and acting like you're not saved and flaunting out there, making weird types of eye contact with people to see who can be seduced. They're mocking you. Ah, 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 gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But all of a sudden, the Bible says that Saul, Saul, uh, Samson's hair began to grow. His hair began to grow again. That is not a, a cosmetic statement. It was a statement of the fact that although he was arrested and although they had got him once, that now something began to grow. His hair began to grow. His consecration began to grow. It wasn't as long as it used to be, but it was gaining some more length. It was gaining some more uh, presentation. So what was going on? His craving for holiness was deepening. And once you start to crave righteousness and crave holiness, what happens? You end up losing a taste for the thing that Satan is using to try to seduce you. All seduction attempts are not going to come from people who are external of your environment or your community. Some of those jokers are going to get right up on you, right close through you. Hey, come preach for me. Hey, come sing for me. Hey, I'm having this event. Hey, I'm having that event. Hey, won't you record for me? Hey, won't you sing tenor on my background? Hey, won't you come to my prayer breakfast? And if you don't have an objective pair of eyes to say, tell hell no, you will not be going there. You will not be doing that. What it is, is a decorative form of seduction to ensnare you into a world that you are nowhere near capacitated to handle, to combat, and to deal with in your flesh. So the strategy is when you're sober, and you're not uh, intoxicated by all of the favor and all of the opportunities and all of the open doors and all of the connections and everybody that's knowing your name and everybody that's hitting you up. When you're not so drunken by that stuff, you've got to invite people in to be a part of your life security staff and you tell them in the event that I start acting erratic or in the event that you notice that my company is becoming ir uh, 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 wrong or I'm starting to hang around with people that don't have good reputation, I give you the right to have a conversation with me to wake me up and to pull me out of the inebriation of opportunity so that I'm not seduced and I don't end up getting somebody pregnant or I don't end up going to sleep with somebody or I don't have a bad night over a couple of drinks with somebody who in the tennis section and we end up doing something we wasn't supposed to do or I end up sleeping with somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife or whatever the thing is that's coming to you. Do not be seduced. I often wonder why we don't have many war vo voices out there. You know, healing is great. Miracles are wonderful. I believe in all that stuff. Prophecy, oh, it's the reason I live. But you know why we don't have people who preach war, who preach deliverance? Because we have even more people committed to helping the people of God believe that you don't have to be delivered and you shouldn't want to be delivered. And if you are delivered, it's only from stuff like depression and sickness. But nobody wants to talk about lust. Nobody wants to talk about witchcraft. Nobody wants to talk about perversion. And so our preachers actually give us permission to remain bound by preaching coping messages that help us to deal with the condition of our flesh and to maintain it because they don't want, we walk right past the cross that Jesus said to lay our lives down on so we don't do it. So at the end of the day, I really want us to be a little bit more assertive about dealing with preachers, about dealing with gifted people, about dealing with ministers, about the subject of seduction. There are certain things, boundaries you've got to have in place. And when it comes from the heart of a father, when you have hear a father's tone in your life. Hey, watch that. Hey, what's that? Hey, what are you looking at that person for? Hey, what is that? It's not control. It's about warning about the power of this, uh, uh, about seduction. And ultimately you're going to end yourself up in a mess. If you won't heed the right boundaries that need to protect your purpose and protect your call and protect your future. Most men don't pre-plan unless they're just wicked people. Most men don't pre-plan to be uh, uh, caught on, on with, a, with, a, with an adulteress. They don't plan to sleep with their uh, uh, administrators. They don't plan and they don't look forward to the day where they get arrested for masturbating in parks and riding around at nighttime with little boys or getting cross-dresser prostitutes and end up being on Channel 7 News. They, most people don't plan or think that way unless they're just wicked and already in reprobate. But what happens? They don't put stuff in place or they don't invite alternate pairs of eyeballs to check them on questionable 
behavior. Who is this? Who is this on this Instagram? Why y'all that close? That don't look like a, 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 a brotherly type of love. Or who is this woman? Why is she sitting this close on you? Or why are you dating and you know you're bound and nowhere near, I mean, you 20 minutes out of fornication and now you talking to somebody else? No, 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 not now. If you're a regular Christian, you are, uh, and I don't, I don't want to say lower level, but if you're a Christian without responsibility, do what you want to do. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're not, I mean, do what you want to do. If you, if you ain't living right and you don't believe in holiness anyway, you can't really hurt nobody but your fool self. So the Bible says whoever falls in his sin and flesh and sexual sin sins against his own body. But those of us who are in authority, we don't just sin against our own body. We sin against the kingdom. We sin against the, the body of Christ. We sin against the plan of God when we use our authority and we don't protect it and we don't put parameters about it. So we have got to be willing to put some context to morality and moral failure. We have got to put our eyes on this whorish spirit that is on Instagram, this whorish spirit that is on Facebook, this whorish spirit that has gone out to America's preacher. I mean, I know bishops that sleep with every pretty young thing they can find. And, and this is why, you know, most of them have dread of real prophets. If they're hanging out with a prophet, what they're doing is that they're actually hanging out with prophets who agree with their lifestyle. They're not going to go to a prophet that walks in the fear of the Lord, or they're not going to go to a prophet who accurately sees. They're going to hang around the lottery dudes, the, you know, the singing and the shouting prophets. Nothing wrong with them, but a lot of them ain't really prophets anywhere. They're just poetic evangelists. But they, most of them will never get a real prophet up close and personal on them unless they know that their behavior is right with them because they're too concerned about what the heck they're going to say and what they're going to see. So I'm concerned about sons and daughters, preachers and teachers and singers and psalmists and songwriters around the world that have nobody to talk to them about seduction. Watch that. Maybe you shouldn't take that invitation. What happens is because talented people are often so rejected and they have so much unfinished business uh, uh, in, with God in their souls before their talent is discovered, they see every opportunity as a moment, the moment of God, the moment of God. You get people reaching out to you. You get people reaching out to you. Come, 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 You know, and you're like, oh, this is God. Oh, God is opening doors. When whoever told you that God is the only power that has the ability to open doors, lied to you, sugar, lied to you. Satan is a door opener. He's a door opener. He knows how to get your greed, your ministry idolatry in such a place where he knows who to reach out to you. He knows who to connect you with. He knows who to make you be impressed by. He knows who to take you to dinner with. He knows that he will open up a devilish door where your life will be changed and you will end up having seeds of wickedness invested because you have so much desire to make it and to be successful and to be platform. And everybody knows that if you do it right, it takes longer. If you're going to be committed to doing anything the right way, church, anything the right way, ministry, anything the right way, God is going to take you the long route because he is more interested in what the long route builds you to do and to know and to understand and to see than taking you somewhere that your soul is not sustained to maintain. And most people, you know, singers, musicians, and preachers, they want a level of success that their soul is nowhere near ready for. You can't handle the type of money you want. You can't handle the record deal that you want. You have no clue what goes with being on these platforms and the war moves that you make when you come out of a life of darkness and now you're platform and everybody's singing your praise and singing your name and buying your CDs. You have no clue of the type of onslaughts and encampments that are preparing for the moment to be the cause of your demise. So my challenge to you is stop going to Delilah's barbershop, letting that have a play in your head because you want to be reminded that you're still a man. And that there is somebody that can minister to you. And so that's how the devil gets in. By letting you know, I don't need your talent. I want the man. I just want to get to know you. I'm a, don't do that. Get out of Delilah's barbershop and stop laying your head in the laps of people that host a destructive agenda for your destiny. You get not, did not get delivered to start playing with Delilah. You didn't get saved and get filled with the Holy Ghost so that you could fool around with Delilah. So stop flirting with these forces that want to end you. Stop with these old dumb, hey, let's check, you know, text messages, Facebook inboxes, Instagram. If I told you half of the foolishness 
that comes to, and you know what, this is how you know people are demonized, is because it's pretty much known that I'm very intolerant with, with wickedness, right? But if I could tell you the celebrity women that have tried to make passes at me, if I could tell you the types of DMs that have come to me and the messages and the pictures and, and all of that stuff, if I could tell you any of that, y'all would be shocked at how people don't care about your platform. They don't care about your sermon. They don't care about none of that stuff. They will reach for you. If I could take, I mean, the stuff that folks send you, you know, uh, all early in the morning, you know, and, and it's crazy. And you, if you're going to protect anything, protect your destiny. No devil. Come and tell you, the one time you trust these people and you fall in your flesh and you fall in sin and you fall in their bed, they're going to keep your secret until it becomes inconvenient from them. This them devils will out you, will blast you, and will wait till you are at a moment of prosperity to say, oh yeah, I know who you are. I slept with you. You're married. I know, you know, so don't do it. And get somebody that got eyes around you who can have hard talks with what you're doing. Who is that? Why are you going to that concert? Who's going to be there? Absolutely not. You're singing background for what? No, you're not ready. That's no. They're they're a good dude. So what? You know, just because a person has good traits, don't mean that they won't be the instrument of hell's agenda for your life. Now look at this heifer. I just got through saying I don't do seduction. She talking about following me for a private show, devil. So no, I I don't play games. You got a real prophet here, and I'm not talking about a New Testament one, a real one who manifests the skills of the Old and New Testament prophets. And so I don't play games with the spirit of Jezebel in men, in women, in opportunity, in platform, in connections, in none of that stuff. I don't play this, and I don't allow anybody around me to play it as well. If I start noticing my gifted men and my gifted women that are are are, are taking, you know, uh, uh, TV interviews with what or mongering uh, 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 talk show hosts or radio interviews with, with preachers that want to sleep with them and seduce them. I know people whose name are passed around like Russian roulettes. Everybody want to sleep with them. Everybody want to take them out. Everybody, I mean, and they fly and they go to different uh, attractions and different places around the nation to sleep with and to act like they're not preachers by night. <clears throat> so seduction actually takes me off so you need to get that same level of hatred for hell in you because you did not get delivered to be seduced don't you sleep with nobody for a record deal don't you sleep with nobody for a concert opportunity don't you sleep with nobody to be ordained don't you sleep with nobody to sit on no front row don't you smoochy face and smoochy emoji and 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 cute line one-liner these people and if you out there and you watch them and you're doing that you need to be rebuked the fear of the Lord upon you. Holiness is still real. And I believe that one of the ways that we've got to prepare men for platforms is by teaching them seduction. Don't let the devil have your strength. All Delilahs are not women with red. Sometimes they're bishops with collars. Other times they are radio promoters. Sometimes they are TV hosts. Sometimes they are, they are married women. Who sometimes they are married pastors, sometimes they are organists, sometimes they choir directors and recording artists, sometimes they Stella Award winning uh, 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 whatevers. You got to believe that seduction is out to kill you. And I ain't having that. So yeah, you want to learn more about seduction? Study what Solomon says in the Book of Proverbs about the strange woman. And if you study her intent and you study her agenda, you'll hear it. You'll identify it the moment it raises his head and you will not be deceived. All right. I love you, beloved. I bid you peace in the precious name of Jesus. I'll be coming back to you tonight with an evening periscope, but I've got to go. I love you guys. Hope you. Uh, and, and listen, here's my final prayer. I'm praying for real fathers. I am so sick and tired. I mean. I would probably go a whole nother hour rant, but I am so grieved about the absence of real father. If one of my sons in the Lord come to me, he, he, and ha ha, that some woman flashed him or kissed him on the neck, I'd rebuke him, go out and find a microphone and rebuke her and tell her, don't come again. I, I don't play with that stuff. Oh, yeah, they really want you. Yeah. That stuff is not funny. 
And you don't use your manhood as an excuse for wickedness and carnality and using your lust to victimize somebody who's going to... See, if you hurt these people, if you sleep with these people, these people are going to crowd up my altar in another year because of what you invested in them with your dates, with your flirts, with your hickeys, with your seduction attempts, all of it. I'm grieved with preachers who make sure that the altars of America's church stay full by giving us more victims because you don't know what to do with your genitalia. So my, what grieves me is the absence of fathers. That's what, what real ones, holy ones that can identify this stuff, teach preachers this stuff, that can take their recording artists and say, okay, I know you want your song heard, but no, we're not going to do that. You're not delivered enough to handle the blows that come with that, that level of publicity and that level of platform. I'm grieved about the absence of fathers in the American church and the men that are using people's talent and not dealing with these structures that are in their soul that are making them inclined towards seduction and seductive attempts so watch it guys every season of promotion is preceded by a seductive spirit sober yourself a test is coming uh yeah so that's it i'll talk to you guys tonight bless you